my smart home can fix itself with no help from me. The more smart devices and automations you have, the more issues you're gonna have to troubleshoot. The dangerous part is that critical automations can go down at any time, meaning we can go hours, sometimes days, never realizing the lights had stopped working or worse. But Kay, my smart home assistant, not only detects when things go wrong, it also takes steps to actively fix it all by itself. Get excited. A big issue with having a smart home is maintenance. You would think that you could just set and forget your automations and expect it to work. Lies and slander. Lies and slander. Your devices will gaslight you. They will stop working for no reason. And then out of nowhere, they're just going to start working for less than no reason. And keeping everything working can become a full-time job. Now, this is a problem I'm having Kay, my smart home assistant, fix. But Michael, a smart home is a metaphysical manifestation of stuff, right? Your automations don't have hands and feet. How can they fix anything? Well, you'll be surprised. Let's consider the following problem. My smart home uses local services, Home Assistant, and Node-RED. Home Assistant is the connective tissue of my smart home and of most smart homes really. And it connects all of the devices so that they work together in one place. Node-RED is a visual tool that lets you take those connections and automate tasks using drag and drop blocks instead of code. You can create logical flows for your smart home. If this, then do that. That's how Node-RED, you know, does its thing. Now, while these services are robust, they sometimes hang. Now, when this happens, automation stop working and devices go offline and we leave ourselves vulnerable as you expect. My smart home needs to do three things to handle these issues. First, it needs to detect that important services and devices are down. The second is that it needs to trigger some kind of restart. And then last, it needs to alert me if it succeeded or failed. How can your smart home detect outages, you ask? One way is with a canary. And no, I'm not talking about Tweety Bird. This is something else that's pretty cool. So back in ye old times, right, miners would take canaries into caves or into the mines. As long as they could hear the canary, everything was good. So in software development, the principle is pretty much the same. You have a canary that pings the APIs and the services you care about. If it doesn't get the right response back, then there's a problem. A more common name for this is a heartbeat. And just how life support systems can listen for patients' heartbeats, we can create a recovery system that can listen to home assistant's heartbeat to ensure that it's alive. We have an automation that periodically listens for responses from the services that we care about. And listening for responses doesn't have to be fancy either. It can be as straightforward as just seeing if the website loads. But hold on, how can you fix an automation with an automation? If Home Assistant and Node-RED are the things that you use to fix automation, and those are the things that you're testing to see if it's down, how can you resolve that conflict? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm using another visual workflow tool called N8N. N8N is basically a sexier, younger sister of Node-RED. I wanted this recovery system to sit outside of my home infrastructure and using NNN and having it set on the outside gives me several advantages. First, I don't have to worry about which physical device this particular service needs to be hosted on, which means that NNN will be unaffected by anything that happens within the home. Think power outages, network outages, device failures, etc. This ultimately protects it by keeping it decoupled from my existing system. My NNN instance is hosted on Hostinger but you can install it on any computer in your home network if you'd like. I'm gonna also preface this with the fact that I am not a network engineer. Talking about TCP protocols and DNS makes me irrationally upset, but Hostinger was pretty easy to set up. They even have an N8N application pre-configured so you can hit the ground running pretty fast. Let me be clear, I am not sponsored by Hostinger and I'm paying for my own servers. However, if you are interested in trying it out, and would like to support the channel, I do have a link in the description. Let me get this straight. You're saying that you want your smart home to fix itself when important services like Home Assistant and Node-RED goes offline. And you're saying that the first step is detecting these outages using a canary test. And you're saying that these canary tests are easy to do because it's as simple as just seeing if a website is active. And you're saying to ensure that the canary test is working, you're using N8N, on some cloud service, not in your home. 
Okay, that seems to track. Once every hour, I have NADN making a network request to both Home Assistant and Node Red to make sure that they're both up. What, what if, if they, they fail? fail? Well, if they fail, then this is where the second step comes in. Now, my kryptonite is anything network or hardware related, so I spent a considerable amount of time and effort to discover the most overpowered engineering technique to fix issues like these, and that's turning it off and on again. So if any of my services fail this canary test, then I employ this awesome power of turning it off and on again. For my Node-RED instance, this is pretty easy. I have a custom API endpoint that's sitting on this computer back here, you probably can't see it, that I can call from anywhere and it would trigger a restart. So that's gonna be super simple. For Home Assistant, I can SSH into the device and trigger a graceful restart using the terminal. Now here's the challenge. My devices are snugly tucked behind my network. And NADN, as if you remembered, is physically away from my network. So how can it turn anything off and on again when it doesn't have access to my home, virtual private network? I have a post that explains the process of connecting one service like, let's say, something on a cloud to your home network using things like Tailscale. You can check the link in the description for that blog post. Okay, so small recap. So far, we're running canary tests once every hour to detect when a service is down. And if a service is unresponsive, then we're gonna trigger a reboot. And all of this is taking place on an automation platform called NADN. The last step is getting the alert. I'm using Telegram. That's what I like to use. But you can use Slack, you can use whatever you want. You can even send an email, smoke signals, whatever you want, I don't care. And you should keep two things in mind. The first thing is that you should choose a method of communication that's agnostic for your system. For example, if your system is down and your smart home is unable to recover itself, then your messaging system should not rely on your smart home to alert you, right? If your system is down and your system needs your smart home to alert you, that's not a good messaging platform. The second thing, and perhaps maybe the more important thing, is that you don't wanna be overwhelmed with the messages. The more messages you get, the more likely you're going to ignore it. So my advice is that you only send alerts when the system is down and unable to recover itself. Altogether, the system works like this. activity in your backyard. Now, if a self-recovering smart home seems awesome, it actually gets way more unhinged. In order to impress you with this evolution, I need to talk about the trade-offs first. So while this recovery system is meant to save you time by autonomously detecting and fixing problems on your behalf, you don't want maintaining this recovery system to replace the time that you've saved. The level of effort can vary based off of if you're using a VPS or some local Docker container. Like you have to take these things into consideration. If you host this solution locally, you might wanna consider the device that you store it on and maybe having some kind of backup plan or some kind of backup strategy. The idea is that, right, you need to be able to maintain the system too, and you don't want it to be that uh, difficult. And if you're using something like a VPS, you probably want to consider the financial cost. For instance, I'm using Hostinger. And as a result, I don't have to think too hard about ensuring that my system is backed up or maintaining those servers because Hostinger is maintaining those. I just have to make sure that my system is up and running. So trade-offs, right? Trade-offs. Another aspect or trade-off to consider that still sits underneath maintenance is complexity. Now, complexity is the aspect of maintenance that's, quite frankly, very easily overlooked. This will complicate your infrastructure, making it harder to use. At my job, for instance, we have something called a run bug. For each of our systems, we list out all the various things to look for, the methods of restoring the service, you name it. We have to kind of document all those things. Whenever we 
get alerted that there's a problem. We want anyone that's on call to be successful with minimal knowledge of the system. Your NNN flow is that runbook. Just how we update the runbook when we update our services, you're gonna to need to update your flow when your smart home changes. And speaking of smart home changes, this recovery system may also affect how you actually update your system itself. Typically when you run system updates, it's natural to have those systems go offline for a bit. Think about when you're updating uh, different integrations in Home Assistant, right? Sometimes Home Assistant have to shut down and then restart. But if that happens, your recovery system will probably assume that there's a problem and it'll start trying to fix it, which can cause additional chaos. Like you're gonna have to account for that too. You can start to see how this can get out of hand, right? You can add a kill switch or some other automation to disable the recovery system while it updates, but it becomes a slippery slope. It's like this, it's like this, right? It's like using medication to solve one problem and then needing a different medication medication to solve the symptoms of the first medication. I want to take your mind back to the beginning of this conversation when I mentioned now, if a self-recovering smart home seems awesome, it actually gets way more unhinged. This recovery system is actually a good candidate for AI, especially when your system is extremely complex. No matter what, you're gonna need to let your system know what to look for and how to fix it. No matter if you're having AI or you're programming it, like you need some kind of flow or run book for your system to follow in order to diagnose and to fix a particular thing. So then the question becomes, why not do it in plain language and let AI be the engineer on call? Consider this. When something goes wrong with your system, you need to troubleshoot it. Sometimes this can be straightforward where if this problem occurs, then do this solution to fix it. But other times it's trial by error. There's a lot of room for mistakes and eventually stumbling through all those mistakes, you find a solution to the problem. In this video here, I saw this interesting comment from a home assistant tinkerer. It seems to me that AI is best introduced where there are either a significant number of permutations that would make the state machine overly complex or where the actions and or tools selection requires judgment. This comment produced the following train of thought for me. AI isn't perfect. At times it produces inconsistent results. Systems that produces inconsistent results are considered buggy. Our standard of building tech doesn't tolerate inconsistent or buggy results. Are there situations where systems produce inconsistent results not only expected, but potentially useful? I know, if none of that made sense, here's what I mean. Troubleshooting may be a situation where AI excel in the most. When we troubleshoot, we either know exactly what's wrong and the solution needed to fix it, or we try things not really knowing what, but everything that we try narrows down. And while we make mistakes and we remove the issues or the possibilities from the list, we finally come down to the solution. We know AI can do that kind of stuff. And quite frankly, it's okay if it gets things wrong at first, as long as it keeps on iterating until it gets to the right solution. So why instead of you doing that, we just give that task to AI. This can be a good idea or it can be a bad idea, but I really wanna figure this out and try it out for myself. And as always, you can try it for yourself too. 